I'm letting go With our trust I'm holding on This love's the zone Your hope and love This love's the zone Your hope and love In your head I'll face the storms And your will I'm pressing Matthew chapter 5 as we continue our study in Matthew's gospel and the, the theme certainly is the, uh, uh, the coming king in terms of uh, Jesus uh, the Messiah and uh, so we looked at the uh, beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount last week. We'll get to uh, a few of the other principles that he teaches there on the Sermon on the Mount, cover the Beatitudes. We have uh, four things that we're going to look at this morning, and then he follows that uh, next week with uh, six illustrations of uh, trying to help people see that, um, that they're what true righteousness was, and it had to be more than what the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, and the scribes were portraying before the people uh, at this uh, particular time. Let's pray. I think that'd be a really good idea. Father, we just come before you and just pray for a couple obvious things that uh, you'd kind of give me strength and just the clarity of mind to, uh, to bring your word in a way that um, makes sense and is applicable uh, to us, Lord. Uh, it always is, so I just pray that I wouldn't uh, get in the way. We uh, pray for, uh, again, just open hearts that we'd be able to hear what you'd say to us this morning and if we've, if we've uh, been misled or caught up in some kind of a, a self-righteousness, uh, Lord, like that of the Pharisees, uh, we certainly have it in a, in a cultural Christianity in, in the West in particular, Lord, and we want to um, escape that and have a, a true righteousness that is only found by faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we might really live out the blessings, the beatitudes that we looked at uh, last week, God, that you'd work those things uh, in our lives. And uh, as we look at these, again, characteristics of a, of a genuine disciple once again this morning. So, Lord, we just pray you'd bless in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Uh, again, last week, the Beatitudes, the blessings uh, that we looked at, and we talked about the fact that <clears throat> somebody asked me about it again this morning. Uh, I, I think that that was taught for a number of years in some circles that uh, here's these characteristics of being a peacemaker and so on and so forth, as though that's something we'll enjoy someday in the millennial kingdom of Christ. But that's certainly not the context. The context is the formal calling of his disciples. He takes them up on the hill. He looks at the crowd and says, boy, sit down here. I got something to share, <laughs> share with you. And your life is really going to be blessed if... You know what it really is, a sorrow over your sins. And, and he kind of takes them through this, this whole thing, what we might call some of these negative aspects as well as positive aspects of, uh, of what it means to be a genuine disciple. Uh, from that, then, he launches out to try to deal with uh, the issue of, uh, of the Pharisees. There was a, a, a very simple kind of uh, <coughs> Judaistic um, uh, phrase at that time that said, uh, if there were only two people that made it to heaven, it would be a Pharisee and a scribe. <laughs> that was the common thinking in Jesus' day. Therefore, when he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisee and the scribe, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure Peter and the boys, their mouths were you know, dropping as, as they would uh, occasionally at the teaching of, of Jesus. And what does he possibly mean? How can we possibly surpass what these guys do? But again, he was talking to a, a superior righteousness, uh, one that we understand now from this side of things in terms of uh, a faith in Jesus Christ because of his finished work uh, upon the cross. But that's what Jesus is dealing with. Uh, in their lives, helping them to understand it. And certainly there's some things that are important for us as well. The first one is that Jesus calls us, as he did them, to a preserving influence. And we see that in verse 13, a very familiar verse. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So, we would say, uh, first, as uh, disciples, we have an opportunity to be a preserving influence in our culture. 
And uh, a couple things that are uh, important to just kind of note uh, about this, and that is the idea of when he says you, it's, uh, the term is plural, uh, and, uh, and also it's in a tense that means you and only you. In other words, you disciples of Jesus Christ, this group that would later become the foundation of the church, the church is really the only one, the only thing that can be a preserving influence within culture and society and uh, in, the, in the world today. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because uh, Christianity uh, within general is certainly under attack in our own country. Uh, um, I, I don't know if it's ever been uh, uh, more under attack, but as though, and so, some of the best-selling books in the New York Times uh, list this year uh, by uh, atheistic writers who basically have come against uh, Christianity to say how what's wrong with us in terms of our influence on society, and they're really bypassing the idea of real history and what's transpired because of Christianity. Uh, now, I want to go to uh, talk about that in a moment and read a, kind of an extensive quote from uh, Chuck Colson uh, based on a book that was written a couple of years ago. But I want to take you through uh, this concept or the idea of, of um, boy, are they going to miss us when we're gone? <laughs> Christianity really is a, a preserving influence on, on the world today, whether our critics would like to admit it or not. And some of them that have researched it have come to the conclusion that we are, which is uh, uh, very, uh, very interesting. But we won't always be here in terms of the church because we know at a, a point in time in the future, the church will be caught up. We will be raptured to be with the Lord. Uh, and, uh, and, and Paul talks about that, and we went through this in our study in 2 Thessalonians, but 2 Thessalonians 2, six, he's here talking about the Antichrist. He says, and uh, now you know what is holding him back, him being the Antichrist, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. He is, being, is holding back, uh, verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. We went into some detail to talk about the he that's being spoken about here is the Holy Spirit, but very specifically, the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. In a point in time in the future, we know from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, that the church will be caught up, will be raptured to be with the Lord. At that point in time, this preserving influence like salt will no longer be there. Let me back up a minute. Again, in the ancient world, salt was used to preserve food primarily. That was its primary use. Bacteria grows on food. You put the salt on it, kills the bacteria. It can be preserved. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, our lives, the church, is to be a preserving influence like salt being placed on food that would otherwise be rotten. And we live in a pretty rotten world, and it would be a lot worse his next illustration, a lot darker if it were not for Christians and Christianity uh, and uh, the teaching uh, of Jesus Christ. Paul says, a point in time, all of that's going to be removed when, again, the Holy Spirit, who is God, who is omnipresent, will still be present here on earth. But in terms of its uh, activity within the life of the church, it will be taken out in that preserving flavor, that preserving nuss of the church uh, is going to be gone. They'll miss us when we're gone because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of bad things that begin to happen at that point uh, as we uh, have made our way through the book of Revelation and seen that. Let me take you to uh, the other uh, parallel passages of, of our passage here in Matthew. One is Matthew 16, verse 18. Excuse me. This is uh, still uh, Jesus making a, a statement to Peter he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, uh, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And, uh, and certainly we know that uh, Jesus is not talking about little pebbles there, Peter, that we uh, got introduced to a few weeks ago. But the statement of Peter that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it's on that statement, the Messiahship of Jesus, that the church, the foundation is built, and the gates of Hades, of hell, will not uh, prevail against us. But... We won't always be here. Uh, and, uh, and also we note certainly that the church is helpless apart uh, from the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this restraining presence that, uh, that is here. Now, uh, I mentioned the, the quote from Chuck Colson, and I want to read that to you. It's, uh, it's based on a book called Christianity on Trial. And uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about uh, Christianity, what it means to the world today, but uh, uh, maybe this will help kind of... Uh, 
bring these things to light. He says, quote, the book Christianity on Trial reminds us the world has been changed for the better precisely because Christians weren't willing to treat their faith as a purely private matter. In no area has this been more true in Christianity championing the, the weak, the poor, the sick, and the defenseless. In their chapter on charity, authors David Shifleth and Vincent Carroll remind us how revolutionary the Christian doctrine of mercy has been. They quote historian John McManners, who noted that the classical world into which Christianity was born, quote, regarded mercy and pity as pathological emotions, defects of character to be avoided by all rational men. The concept of mercy that we enjoy is a Christian concept that did not exist prior to Christianity. He goes on and says, but Christians have a different view. They knew that God's grace and mercy were unearned, and so they were uh, uh, unable to withhold mercy from others. They also knew that their Savior had instructed them to see his face in the face of the poor and desperate. Jesus' words still ring through history, as you have done these things to the least of my brethren, you have done them unto me. The church has never regarded this command as optional, and Christians throughout the ages have served Christ by serving the poor in many world-changing ways. The just war theory developed beginning with Augustine, an expression of Christian mercy even in war. During the 19th century, hundreds of volunteer associations were born to fight every social ill from drunkenness to prostitution to child labor. Christians have founded thousands of orphanages, schools, clinics, and hospitals. These and countless other public expressions of Christian faith in the form of mercy literally have changed the world, and the world still needs that kind of changing. Fortunately, Christians still have the vision. Love and action ministries to people with AIDS. International justice mission circles the globe, prosecuting law cases for the needy who are uh, denied justice. The Salvation Army takes the money from those Chris Christmas kettles and uses it to care for the down and out. And Prison Fellowship extends mercy to prisoners, their families, and their communities. And, end quote. and we could go on and on, but uh, we often take it for granted, even in ourselves. Whether you go out there every day to do that or not, if you are a, a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are the salt of the earth. You are a, a, a preservant to keep this world from getting, from getting worse. When we're in India and we're walking down the streets uh, and we see a man bleeding and possibly dying on the streets, we kind of have to keep going uh, sometimes, and it's very, very heartbreaking. It's what they call having culture shock. Uh, and uh, the reason that uh, nobody stops to help this man or this child is because of their worldview, because of their religious view. Because as a Hindu, if he's there bleeding and dying, it's because his karma says that that should happen to him. And there's no need to show him mercy. He's only getting what he earned in his previous life. Maybe he'll do it better the next time around. Uh, it, it's the same thing. Uh, when, when, uh, when our guys in Iraq and Afghanistan capture prisoners, they don't, they don't set up a video camera and behead them and put it on the internet like our enemies do because of the just war theory. We believe even our enemies, we should show mercy to them. Christianity has made a huge difference in the Western world and sometimes the rest of the world takes us for granted but they'll miss us when we're gone uh, because Christianity is the salt, whether, whether you do that or not. Now, it's interesting because his next metaphor is going to be a light in a dark world. That's something we do. Whether you, whether you actively are doing anything or not, your presence here on earth, our presence here on earth, because of our worldview, because of what we believe, because God has shown us mercy and love and told us to do the same, we do, and that's a radical concept that the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't know. It's very interesting when we go and do ministry in Japan and are assisting the ministries that are already there. It's uh, very difficult sometimes in sharing the gospel because culturally they don't know the concept of grace and they don't even have a word for it. Uh, if, if, for example, if, if somebody in a, in a family commits a crime and he goes off uh, and serves his sentence in jail and then he comes back to that town or vi village, they don't exactly tie the yellow ribbons on the old oak tree. 
No, they meet him at the edge of the town and give him his belongings and say, don't come back because you have shamed us and dishonored us because they don't understand the concept or know the concept of grace, unmerited favor. And it's certainly a concept that has to be taught and even a word given for it just to share the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Having grown up in a Western culture, we kind of take a lot of this for granted. It's exactly what Jesus was talking about. Now, uh, Paul talks about it in, in another way. Salt was used for preserving. It was also used the same way we use it in terms of, uh, of flavoring. And Paul mentions that in Colossians 4, 6. He says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer uh, everyone. So our conversation with others, this is talking about uh, unbelievers. How do we converse with them? Well, in our conversation, it should be gracious, not condemning. It should be seasoned with salt. Uh, it should have a certain flavor to it that would invite people so they would want to listen to us and, and hear us. You know, we're not going to win anybody to the Lord beating them over the head with a big King James Bible and telling them they're on their way to hell. That all may be true, uh, but uh, Paul says that's not the way you know how to answer everyone. It's by letting your conversation be full of grace uh, and seasoned with salt. Now, Mark 9.50 is the other par parallel passage of uh, what we're looking at in Matthew 5. There Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness... How can it be? Uh, make it? Uh, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace uh, with each other. So, again, the idea is that the church is to be the salt of the earth as believers, as disciples. But secondly, as disciples, we can lose the opportunity apparently to be a preserving influence in our culture. And I think we've already already seen that in different places around the world. In Jesus's day. Again, how does salt lose its saltiness? I think it just always tastes salty to me. I don't care how old it is. Well, uh, it, it loses the ability to be used when it becomes contaminated. When it becomes contaminated, uh, you, you're not going to spread it on your meat to preserve it. You're not going to uh, put it on your food to, uh, to, to eat. If you do, you may feel like I do now. Uh, but uh, you're not going to do that. And so what do you do? What they did, they would actually throw it out onto the, the footpaths because it would kill the vegetation. Therefore, it's trodden under by the foot of men. And um, I don't know if you've ever done that, but I've, I've got this uh, mini forest of uh, bamboo that I've been fighting in my backyard for 20 years now. Uh, but one of the ways I initially got it under control, you can kind of spray it with Roundup. Bamboo is the fastest growing grass in the world. I mean, you can almost watch it. You know, it, that's, it's that fast. And uh, it's amazing, yeah, because, we, oh, how beautiful. Yeah, I got a little different view of it. But uh, uh, anyway, you know, you, I spray it with Roundup and it kind of mutates, you know, turns yellow. It's still growing though. So I remember an uh, older guy told me, oh, he says, uh, next time you're at the store, um, uh, just buy one of those big five-pound bags of Hawaiian rock salt. You go out there, break it open, just dump it right on there. And uh, just every couple of months, you're at the store, pick up another bag. Hey, eventually, the rock salt will melt, get down into those roots, and the salt will, will kill it. And I've actually killed a large portion of it today. <laughs> and I'm still working on, uh, on the rest of it. But uh, that's what salt does. Jesus says that, in terms of our lives being a preserving influence, uh, there can come a time when they don't do that anymore because our lives, our witness for Christ, is so contaminated that it's actually thrown out and trodden under by the foot of men. And, uh, and we become the scorn and so forth and the, uh, the place of, uh, of jokes. And certainly the, the, the world loves that, you know, don't they? They love it, you know, anytime a minister uh, falls into some kind of a sin. I mean, there's literally tens of thousands of pastors around the country, faithful to God, teaching God's word, loving God's people. They're in the headlines all the time, aren't they? No, <laughs> but if there's one guy somewhere that falls, then that's a, a big headline story. You know, if anybody robs a bank, you know, sometimes you hear a former Sunday school teacher today in Georgia, you know, it's like, what does that got to do with him robbing the bank? He used to be, there's never a former Kiwanis Club member today, you know, I mean, 
<laughs> but if the guy ever had anything to do with Christianity, that's the lead, you know, going into the, uh, into the story here. The world loves to trot in underfoot, and, uh, and there's a real concern. Old Testament classic example, uh, Samson. Samson was to, was to be the salt and the preserving, holding back the Philistines uh, from Israel. But as you know, his life, rather than purity, became contaminated, and he was literally trodden under the feet uh, of, of the Philistines. We, uh, I think the church in the United States is at a critical juncture, and, and if you were here Wednesday night, and we uh, spent some time in the Truth Project looking at uh, our, our foundation, our, our founding fathers, uh, uh, our judicial system, uh, all built upon uh, a, a Christian worldview and how radically that's changed uh, over the years. It was, a, it was a great presentation. At the same time, if you look at what's going on in Western Europe, I think you could say that uh, they're no longer salt. They, they've lost their preserving uh, flavor. We think of, the, uh, of Great Britain and, and the uh, hundreds of missionaries that they sent out over, uh, over the world and so forth, the, the incredible, beautiful cathedrals that are now mosques. Uh, in fact, there's a, a whole terminology for what's going on in Europe. It sometimes is called Eurabia because there's such a huge Muslim uh, influence. Prince Charles speaks at more Muslim mosques than he ever does any kind of a, uh, churches in England anymore. And he and... Um, and, uh, uh, and the queen have rolled out the red uh, carpet to Islam. And it's a, it's a tremendous influence uh, now in Europe, not only England, but France and, and Spain in particular. It's just radically changed. It's not the influence. It's not the preserving flavor. Can you imagine a country where there is not one Christian radio station? Not one Christian radio station. There are Christian programming that buy programming on secular stations. But there's not one Christian radio station owned and operated full-time, 24-7 in the whole country. That's pretty dark. Uh, Jesus says, there can, this is what it should be, but there can come a time with contamination. Again, how does that happen? Well, certainly the purity of our own lives and, and uh, 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 turning away from the Word of God and so forth, that we become so contaminated, we're no good for a witness for Jesus Christ, we end up being trodden under. It can happen individually. It can happen to an uh, entire country. So very important, verse 13, Jesus calls us to be a preserving influence. Secondly, Jesus encourages us not to miss the purpose for our lives. And we see that in verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father uh, in heaven. Uh, the obvious statement, the purpose of a disciple is to be a light. Um, and again, same thing, the you is plural. It means you and only you. And uh, the illustrations would be that of a city on a hill or a, a light in a home that you would not uh, cover. Uh, we are, as disciples of Jesus Christ, Jesus meant for us to be a, a light. And again, the contrast, I think, is very important to see. Salt, I mean, it's just, if you're out there as a believer and living for the Lord, you're going to be a preserving uh, influence. I, it's funny. Have you ever had that? Uh, I've had this experience. I don't wear a, uh, I don't wear t-shirts that says I'm a pastor on it or anything, you know. But I, it's funny. I show up places, whatever I'm doing, and and uh, you know, even playing golf or something like that, or working on a construction site. And after a while, it's like people will cuss, and then, and then they'll, oh, hey, sorry. It's interesting. I didn't say anything, you know. But you, you just are this preserving influence just because you're there and you're not living the way they are. You're not speaking the way that they are. They, they realize it. It's just, it's just by your behavior. Light is different. Uh, the idea, light dispelling darkness. Uh, uh, what is the light? Uh, so let your light shine before men. They're, they're going to see it. Uh, what, what are they going to see? Your good works. So this is what we do more that's, uh, uh, that's out there. Two aspects of our uh, relationship with the world as it relates to our, our witness and so forth. The assumption is that the world is dark. And I want to go through a couple of cross-references where, you know, again, the New Testament, we could go Old Testament, very clear in terms of the fact of what light means, of goodness, truth, and holiness and so forth versus darkness and what it means in the world. Uh, John, uh, John 1, 3 of Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. 
The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Again, Jesus comes. He is the light of men. Same writer, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Those that are purified by the blood of Jesus, those that are not purified, those that are walking in the light, those that are not walking in the light. It's a pretty big contrast, light and darkness. One more, and this is John 8, 12, and the context is a huge Jewish feast. All the large, uh, huge candelabras are, uh, or menorahs are written in the, uh, are lit there in Jerusalem at night, uh, so much that they could be seen for miles away. And in the midst of that, then Jesus stands up uh, and says, uh, when Jesus spoke again, he said, I am the light of the world. This looks bright to you, but I'm the one that's really bringing light, truth, holiness, goodness, all these things that uh, uh, are spoken about here. Uh, there's, uh, uh, again, it's Jesus expects us, the natural consequence of walking with him is that there would be a saltiness to our lives, to our conversation, but more than that, there would be good works. Now, Jesus is contrasting this whole thing, and he's about ready to go into the law, and the Pharisees, and contrasting this whole thing is he's not asking us to be like the Pharisees and follow some kind of written code and so forth as though our good works save us. That's what they believe, their good works would save them. But at the same time, when Paul, coupling in that same classic verse in Ephesians 2, 8, that we're saved by grace through faith, this is not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Um, not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So uh, again, the good works are expected. We don't do good works to attain a righteousness, but the righteousness that we receive from Christ, his Holy Spirit working in us, it's just going to naturally produce, like fruit, it's going to naturally produce good works, things that we do. And that's, that's great. I'm glad God's got a purpose for my life. He's got a reason for me being here as he does you. He's given all of us certain gifts and talents and abilities and certain circles of influence. And every day we go up and, and we see how God might use us in good works uh, for, his, for his glory. Now, there's a, a couple of verses that I want to uh, point out to you that I think are, are interesting that kind of use or pick up on the same kind of metaphor. One is in Philippians 2.14, and I'll read it, but it requires a little explanation. <laughs> Verse 14, uh, do everything without complaining and arguing. Yes, folks, parents, you might want to... Type that out real big, put it on the refrigerator. Get a memory verse for the kids this week. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a, <coughs> a crooked and depraved uh, generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Now to make this work for my next verse, I have to tell you that that, uh, that word shining like stars in the universe, the idea of being a light in the world is... Not exactly right. NIV doesn't get it uh, here. Uh, King James, New King James, uses the word lights. Uh, it comes from a Greek word that we get our word lunar or luminary. So it really means moon. The light that we shine, that we hold out to the universe, is a light that we reflect. It's not self-generated. A star is self-generating -gener light. That's why that's not a good translation there. You need to know that because then I want to go to Malachi 4, verses 1 and 2. Here, the prophet, last one in the Old Testament, the last kind of title given to the Messiah, to Jesus, before he's born on this earth, uh, is from Malachi 4, 2. He says, but for you who revere my name, and this is interesting, the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. When the Messiah comes, he will rise like the sun with healing in his wings. Paul says we're to be like a moon. We just reflect the light of Jesus Christ, to be a light in the dark world. Good works for him. It's what, it's what Christ brings in and through our lives that we simply reflect to others. It's not self-generated. Self what the Pharisees were about were <laughs> it was self-righteousness, self-generating their good works. 
and we're not talking about the same thing. Again, secondly, about this idea of what is the purpose of this reflection, it's uh, the purpose of, uh, uh, of a disciple is to glorify God. Uh, and we'll see as we continue in the Gospels, every word that Jesus did, the good works that he did, the healings and so forth, we'll see a typical phrase, and they went away glorifying God, not in, even glorifying Jesus. I and mean, we're to do our good works in such a way as to call a lot of attention to me. No. Have you seen that FedEx commercial where the, the guy walks in and he's gotten, apparently he's gotten a hole in one? I guess if you watch the Golf Channel, you might have seen this. But uh, anyway, he walks in and he says, uh, and there's uh, his scorecard and it's marked hole in one. And he says, uh, I'd like a banner of this, uh, three by five. Would that do a certain? Yeah, give me a couple of those. And then uh, he says, and, I ought to, and then I want a hundred copies of this. I'd like it collated. Collated, sir? There, <laughs> it's only one copy. Yeah, but what does it say right there? And then he turns the guy's microphone, turns it on. He says, what does it say right there? He says, hole in one. So everybody in the whole store, you know, get here, hole in one. And then he, you know, okay, yeah, that's what I want, you know. Uh, it's not enough just to get it. You know, you, you know it's like, uh, you know, you want everybody to know about it. Uh, sometimes, again, that's what the Pharisees were all about. When these guys give an offering, and these guys, uh, you know, went to the extreme on, on everything. But uh, in that court of the women, sometimes called the court of the treasuries, because that's where the offering boxes were. Tell me if you think this is a good idea. We've got a little offering box back there. Uh, they would place on the top of the box a metal, what looked like the, uh, uh, a trumpet. Uh, you know, it was a big funnel that went down. So, and, of course, the, the offering had to be in shekels, so it was in coins. So when you put your offering in, it's kind of like that sound that, uh, you know, winning the jackpot at Vegas. You've probably just seen it on television, of course. But that, that, that's the kind of noise, through the metal. So, you know, they, they, they would, you know, a little at a time, they'd just lay it on. Hey, how are you today? And just be, you know, dumping the offering in. I mean, everything was about, you know, look at me and what I'm doing uh, for, for the Lord. And Jesus brings the contrast to us as believers to say, so let your light <coughs> shine before men in terms of your good works so that it may glorify your Father in heaven. That's the example that Jesus gave us that he wants us to follow. So, again, a preserving influence. There's purpose for our lives. And then three, Jesus came to perfectly fulfill the law. And we see that in verses 17 to 19. Where he says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. One thing you need to know is that when he uses the phrase law and prophets, uh, he's not talking literally about the Torah, the first five books of Mo Moses as being the law and then some of the prophets. It's just a phrase that means the Bible. Uh, it's, the, it's the equivalent, it's what we call the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible. Uh, Jesus is saying that, that nothing in the Bible, and, and he uses a phrase equivalent in the English to dotting an I and crossing a T uh, in the Hebrew to say uh, not one of those will disappear until everything is, uh, is fulfilled. There's been a few people to try to destroy the Bible over the years. Jesus says, uh, it's not going to happen. He says, uh, he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to perfectly uh, fulfill it. And, uh, and certainly he did. As a little boy, he would have uh, grown up. He would have been bar mitzvah. He would have gone through everything to fulfill the law. He was dedicated on the right day, so on and so forth. And at his baptism, we saw his father in heaven said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He has fulfilled all the law at that point. And certainly we know that through his life in terms of his perfect sinlessness and through his death and his resurrection, uh, he perfectly fulfilled all the law and all the prophets. It's what they said, who the Messiah should be, where he was born, how he would live, how he would die, his resurrection, all the details of his death, so on and so forth, that Matthew will continue to bring those out, again, writing to a, a Jewish audience. Has Jesus completely fulfilled all the prophets? Not yet. 
because again, if you read through the minor prophets, they tell you a lot about the messianic kingdom, the thousand year reign of, of Christ and what will happen, where it will be. Well, we, we haven't got that far yet. But certainly, Jesus says everything will be perfectly fulfilled uh, in the end. Uh, it's important that we kind of look at this and understand that <laughs> the, the Old Testament was the only Bible Jesus had, the only one that, that Paul had. Uh, there's kind of a, a move in the church in the 3rd and 4th, 5th century to begin to call, because it got very, frankly, very anti-Semitic at that point, which is, was an odd thing, uh, but it did, begin to call that part of the Bible the Old Testament and the, and the writings of, uh, of the Gospels and Paul and, uh, and so forth, the New Testament, as though, and it's, we don't need the old anymore because we have the new. That's actually a Roman Catholic uh, idea. Somebody asked me about uh, Easter this year, you know, right before I came up. How come Easter is always changing and everything? <laughs> so, well, it's weird uh, because, uh, you know, when, when is Easter resurrection supposed to be? You know, it's supposed to be, of course, you know, the, the first day of the week following Passover. Jesus dies. He's the Passover lamb. But they're like a month apart. And it's because uh, we don't really, we, it's all based on a calendar that came about through Roman Catholicism about the, the, the fourth century. Based on a, a lunar calendar, you know, a certain Sunday in March, and not really when it was supposed to be. We've really moved away from uh, really what Jesus said was so important that, that none of it would disappear. It would all be there to the very end because we get this idea that, well, it's the old and I'm not under the law, so it doesn't really concern me uh, anymore and, and so forth. But uh, it's all very important because we really can't understand the New Testament if we don't understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the foundation to the house. It's not going to make any sense if we start putting up the walls and putting in the windows if we don't understand the, the foundation. You cannot understand the book of Revelation if you do not understand, uh, especially um, the, the first five books uh, uh, of the Old Testament. We say Revelation is back to the future. If you want to understand the future, when John is talking about uh, what heaven is like, we get the details because the tabernacle is a pattern, a shadow, and a type of heaven. And so these things begin to make sense to us. And there's, a, uh, again, within Western Christianity, a divorcement of these two things that have been that have really been a shame. Uh, we could give a number of verses, but Psalm 19, I love it. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. But because Jesus fulfilled all of the, what we call the ceremonial law, somehow we think that uh, uh, sometimes the Old Testament no longer pertains to us, and Jesus says that's not the case. Now, if you're around here long enough, you know that we teach a lot of Old Testament books on Sunday morning. We're going through the book of Psalms uh, on uh, Wednesdays and, and so forth. But, uh, hello. Okay. Wasn't ready for that. <laughs> I guess the uh, ready for the delivery back there. Uh, there's nothing again with the wrong with the law of God. It's holy and righteous and true. The problem is, is us. We're, we're we're unable to keep it. The law is good for the purpose which God gave it, but He never gave it to us to make us righteous. And the Pharisees were trying to take the law and be able to use it for their own purpose to attain their own uh, their own righteousness. There's, uh, I don't want to kind of beat a dead horse here, but I want to uh, talk about this just a little bit more. There's three aspects of the law. One is the moral law. Uh, again, the Ten Commandments. Would you agree that it's not a good thing to, to murder, to lie, to cheat, to commit adultery, to covet, to you know, worship false gods and, you know, and use the Lord's name in vain? Uh, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated again in the New Testament. The only one that's not is uh, worshiping on the Shabbat or the Sabbath because that was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant for Israel, for the Jewish people. It does not apply to us uh, at all. But all the others certainly do in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus said all of the law and all the prophets can be summarized in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as, as yourself. If you do these, you've kept all of the law. And of course, somebody went, uh, well, who would my neighbor be exactly? And then he goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, the second aspect of the law is the judicial law. 
It has to do with criminal law and personal liability. It is what we saw Wednesday night. Our legal system was founded on these principles by our founding fathers, and that really did not change until about the turn of the last century when uh, the idea was introduced of, of case studies and that now law is determined based on previous cases and so forth, which is kind of like shifting sand because that's always changing uh, with different judgments, whereas what God laid out was a, a firm foundation for us. But the judicial law, if you read through that, the liabilities and so forth, hey, that's still totally applicable to our lives today. The ceremonial law is the law about sacrifices and so forth. That, that was all fulfilled in Jesus. And as the writer of Hebrews says, we no longer really uh, look to that or pertain to that because it's all fulfilled in Christ. Although we study it because it tells us about Jesus. When we talk about the table of showbread, uh, we know that he's the bread of life. When we talk about the, uh, the menorah, we know that he's the light of the world. And we could go on and on. Everything in the temple uh, speak to us of, of Jesus. Here, secondly, he came perfectly to fulfill the law in his teaching. And he says, anyone who breaks the law or teaches others to do so will be least in the kingdom. But anyone who obeys and teaches others will be great in, in the kingdom. So it's not a divorcement of all these things. and We're not under the law. We're saved by faith and, and so forth. But Jesus says none of these things are going to fade away, uh, not, uh, not crossing the, the T or, or dotting the, uh, the I. But the whole point was is that the law was never intended to, to make us righteous. And that gives us to our, our fourth point, which is Jesus presents a new standard of righteousness. Verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So here he presents a new standard of righteousness that is far superior to that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because theirs was all about outward show. Uh, the Pharisees had a little tradition. Uh, they thought they were more spiritually. For example, if, uh, if you saw one of them in Jesus' day and he had little bruises on his forehead. Why would that make you very spiritual? Well, it meant that when he walked around in public, he didn't gaze upon a woman to lust after her. So oh, he would kind of walk into a, oh, hit a little pillar here. <laughs> Listen, we do the same things. I, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the guys that I admire a lot and had a big influence over me early on in the ministry, Gail Irwin, uh, would talk about the, the Christian subculture that he grew up in. If he talked to another pastor on a Monday morning, you got to talk like this, you know, because if you weren't whores, you hadn't really preached on Sunday. <laughs> so whether you, brothers and sisters, whether you did that or not, if you talked to another guy on Monday and you were part of that group or denomination, you kind of had to give the horse thing because that meant that you'd really given the word the day before. I mean, you know, we can look at the Pharisees and go, man, I'm glad we're not like them. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's, there's places where... I mean, I'm, I'm thankful when I go to a Calvary Chapel pastor's conference, I can just, you know, actually I wear a jeans and a t-shirt. I just kind of dress up for you guys. But if I went to other denominational conferences, I'd have to put my coat and tie on. I don't know if they let me in the door. I mean, there'd, some, there'd be some great preaching going on. I wouldn't mind doing that in order to get in there and not be stoned or whatever. But I'm just saying that, you know, we, we, we got our own stuff as well that, has not, that is cultural, that is not biblical, uh, that still goes on. Uh, because we begin to think, because our flesh loves this idea of outward appearance. Uh, I'm, I know that none of you guys even glanced in the mirror this morning. You just tore right out the door to get here. No, you, yeah, actually, uh, it's kind of a big deal to us, isn't it? This outward appearance, uh, how, what people think of us, you know, and all the way to, you know, the, the brand of uh, clothes we have to the brand of foam that we we have and so forth. I mean, we, we're, we're pretty, as Americans, hung up on all this status symbol stuff. And it's, it's Phariseeism that bleeds over into our Christianity. Uh, and we need to be very, uh, very careful uh, about it. I remember a, a number of years ago, we, uh, uh, a mom had called me and really concerned about her teenage daughter who <clears throat> was, you know, about a, you know, a, a junior in high school, going to uh, Kailua High School and and uh, not really walking with the Lord, and uh, she wanted to see, she, she wanted to make sure her daughter would be accepted if she could even get her to church uh, on a Sunday, and, uh, and she, and so I said, I'm like, yeah, I think so, you know, and everything, and, 
And she came the next week, and I, okay, I see what she mean. <laughs> she was, I've never seen a pair of pants with so many pukas in them. That was just the style then, you know, the, the real worn out jeans kind of a thing, and the knees are just all shredded out, and I think she had a few holes in her, her uh, blouse as well. And, uh, you know, a couple of piercings that were a little bit unusual, and, uh, but she came in. But I uh, just appreciated the fact that, that nobody cared that uh, everybody loved Jesse, it didn't really matter. They just saw her as somebody that needed the Lord and uh, embraced her, literally hugged her, and she was blown away because she, she kind of went over the top to see if she could get us to reject her so she could tell her mom, see, I told you, I'm not going back there again. And she got the opposite. I'm, people took her out to lunch and stuff, you know. And, uh, and it was great. Within about three months, she'd come to faith in, in Christ. Her whole life radically, radically turned around. But Phariseeism would keep that from happening if outward adornment was so important that uh, we all look the same and, and so forth. It's always a scary thing if you go into church and everybody looks the same and has the same haircut and <laughs> wears the same clothes. That's probably not a good place to be. But there's a lot of those places that are, that are out there, and we need to be very careful. This is very uh, uh, applicable. Jesus is trying to present a, a standard of righteousness that is far superior, but Again, remember, Peter and the boys kick back there on the lawn at the top of this mountain, and they're already kind of blown away by this whole beatitude thing because they're, you know, they don't exactly see themselves as poor in spirit and all this, and they're trying to track along. This is all very new to them. Uh, Jesus is teaching with his own authority. He's not quoting the other rabbinical teachers or anything, and they're trying to, they're trying to you know, stay along with this whole thing, but it's kind of a steep learning curve, and these are just basic Galilee fishermen uh, with no formal education. Uh, and now he says that the, the two people everybody looks up to, if your righteousness doesn't surpass them, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> They're like, okay, we got big chances here because they don't really get it and they won't get it for a while. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at their comical episodes as, as we go along, still wondering who's going to be greatest in the kingdom and who's going to sit on the right and who's going to sit on the left. And, and they're still looking for Jesus to wonder, wear one of those Burger King looking crowns, you know, but real gold. Uh, they don't realize that the crown he's about ready, ready to wear is a crown of thorns. Uh, they're, they're got a lot of adjustments to go here uh, over the next couple of years with, with Jesus. But uh, again, he's trying to teach them that it's, it's an internal work that he wants to do. He wants to give us a righteousness that can only come from him, impute it to us, Paul says. And, uh, and, and it's not one that we work for. Uh, secondly, he presents a, a new standard of righteousness that, again, we're kind of alluding to, brings uh, entry into the kingdom. It's not going to be uh, by the law. And again, because the Pharisees were going to try to take the law and use it to make it, if they could keep it, at least by appearance only, uh, they could attain a righteousness. Jesus is about ready to blow all that away in six illustrations by saying, you've heard it said in the past, you know, do not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you even lust looking upon another woman, you've already sinned. It's like, okay, it's getting tougher all the time. But he's trying to say, you're not going to get there. It's not going to happen. It's got to be a righteousness that is better than that. It's got to be a righteousness because the law could, is, was never intended to give you a righteousness. Let me read from, uh, from Galatians. Paul here talking about that. He says, uh, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, see the law could not impart life. Uh, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Righteousness didn't come by the law. But Scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Righteousness could not come from the law. It was never designed to do that. The whole world is a prisoner of sin. The only chance we've got is faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says, who knew the law very well. Verse 23, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. 
You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Another uh, place Paul says, or translation, it's like a schoolmaster to drive us to Christ. What was the intention of the law? Not to give us righteousness like the Pharisees were trying to do, which they could only model it outward at best. It was to be like a, a schoolmaster to take supervision of us because we're held like prisoners under sin. Uh, in the law, waiting for faith to come in Jesus Christ. Listen, I, you know, Paul says, I didn't even know it was a sin to covet till I read in the law, do not covet. And then it's like, I'm busted again. Uh, the law doesn't give righteousness. It actually shows us our sin and our need for a savior. I, I, I know I've told the illustration before, but I, I read it uh, again the other day and it kind of uh, cracks me up. It's uh, a uh, true story restaurant on the Gulf of Mexico in, in Texas. Uh, beautiful restaurant, picture windows down below, a hotel built above. And, uh, and from those balcony uh, decks, there was a little balcony there. Uh, guys apparently were from the second floor, especially were in third floor. Uh, they would bring, they would come stay at the hotel and then bring all their fishing gear because they could, they could cast right out into, that's pretty good instead of standing on the rocks. You want me to sit in a hotel room? Anything can get better than that if you're a fisherman. And, uh, you know, you have the AC blowing in the background, you know, so, but if you, if you fish like I do, uh, sometimes that, um, you know, you, sometimes your, your drag doesn't always get clicked all the way over it and you throw and then the, the lead weight goes and it comes flying back this way. And that would happen to the big picture windows and break them. And the insurance company got tired of replacing these huge windows being broken by, you know, three ounce weights. And so they sent a guy out to see what the deal was. Well, he looks at the restaurant. Okay, I'm going to go look at the rooms. He goes up in the rooms and right there and all the, uh, on the railings, uh, it says, uh, no fishing allowed. And he's like, well, that's a problem. I mean, guys are coming up and going, no fishing? Must be pretty good. You know? <laughs> it's a guy thing. And, uh, and all they had to do is they removed all the signs. Never had another problem. I mean, the, the law comes, Paul says, and actually shows us, you know, that we are sinners. I, I didn't even think about coveting until the law said, do not covet. It's like, well, that's a pretty good idea. No, you know, it's not only, it actually draws us in sometimes uh, and then shows us that you're busted again. Uh, that was its intention. We need a savior. Uh, we need the blood of Christ. You know, uh, we need the Messiah to come. We need the coming king that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Matthew is trying to uh, teach them about. Uh, the Pharisees had taken that law and it was never intended to do this. And they said, we can keep at least a pretense of it, even if it's not in our hearts, and try to appear, and they did appear, righteous. Jesus would say of them later, uh, you guys are like sepulchers. You're white on the outside and you look pretty good, but you, you've got rotten, decaying bones in, in your heart. Because they were, I mean, some of these guys that appeared the most righteous and holy were wicked. They didn't care about other people. They had no mercy, uh, no nothing for anyone. And, and Jesus says, that's not the way. That's not the way. Your righteousness, as a genuine believer, it's going to surpass that. And no, they couldn't really get over that. And they haven't heard it all yet because he's getting ready to go on to these illustrations to say it's all about what's in your heart. It's not what you can appear to be. It's not what you can do. Do good works? Absolutely. In response to God has shown us mercy. He's shown us his grace. He's shown us his love. He's given in these things. When we didn't deserve it, says, will you give that to others? I think I, I can give it a shot. Will you give me the glory and not take credit for it when you do? Well, I can try to do that. Good. Uh, that's all he's asking. He's asking us, I mean, and again, as we go through these things, sometimes there's whole books written on the hard sayings of Jesus because they're kind of hard sometimes. Uh, it's, uh, it's like, oh, man, uh, I'm just busted. But the Lord's looking for a willingness uh, in our hearts. And uh, just... As the word is meant to be, we're supposed to read it. It's supposed to read us and go, there's my shortcoming. Lord, I sure need help in that area. And God says, right on, I'll, I'll help you in that area. I'll strengthen you. Are you really poor in spirit? You know, is there really a brokenness, you know, as we went through last week? Oh, you're blessed then because God can really minister to broken hearts uh, and show his mercy. And then we, then we know what real mercy is. You know, if, if things are pretty good all the time, 
It's like my grandfather used to say, you don't miss the water till the well runs dry. You know, I mean, if it's, everything's kind of even keel all the time, well, you know, it's like, yeah, I love the Lord. It's good. But when things get very difficult and he allows that, and then we really cry out, then it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's the whole purpose. He wants us crying out to him. A righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, it doesn't just surpass it. We'd say it's like far superior because it's a whole different dynamic, internal instead of external, uh, to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the teaching laid out here in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And Lord, we could go into lots of illustrations of our own kind of a cultural Christianity, pharmaceutical kind of behaviors and expectations that we might have that we place upon one another that are really not found in your word. So I pray that you'd help us as we go through this and continue to go through this. You'd kind of strip away the exterior and some of the thinking that maybe is not really biblical, not really correct. Lord, that uh, we'd see that you, you care about mercy. You care about compassion. Lord, and, and not outward adornment, whether it be physical or, or, or spiritual. That uh, you, you care about us and want to lead us to a, a better way that we'd be the light of the world. Lord, uh, our good works would bring you, you glory. Someday we're going to stand before you, Lord, and we're all going to wish that, we, that uh, in some way we had done more to give you glory. Pray we'd have that realization uh, in our lives now and, and cry out for your help and the work of the Spirit in our lives to allow us to do that. And Lord, the, the church, a preserving flavor, a preserving... Uh, of our culture. Lord, we pray for our lives individually. We pray for mercy, Lord, upon our, our country that seems to be turning away from you, turning away from uh, your word. Lord, that you would uh, bring revival to the church, uh, that we not end up like some other places nationally where the whole nation is so turned against you that uh, now there's, there's no preserving there. Uh, the salt is thrown into the path. It's trodden under the foot of men. Lord, we've seen you judge your own people in the Old Testament. We should never think that you wouldn't judge an entire country. And when it rains, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous as well. So we, we pray on behalf of our country, Lord, that you'd bring revival and have mercy on us. Don't give us what we deserve, Lord, but give us your mercy. At the same time, we realize, again, it starts with us, starts with our, our own little fellowship here. And we pray that you would give us your mercy and do a work by your spirit in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. In you I feel, in you I see. Everything the way it really should be. In the water and Hope and love.